I'm setting up a new sneaky end-fed half-wave antenna at my apartment today. Let me show you what I've cooked up. I've been hoping to get a vertical on top of the roof there, but it seems there just is no roof access to the top of our three flat. So I've plotted out an end-fed half-wave that's gonna stretch from that very upper window there to the top of my garage. We'll see how that works out. I'll go ahead and say right now, because I know people are gonna ding me on it, the power and data lines here look like they're gonna be really close to the path of this antenna, but I've got at least 10 feet of separation between each of them and the antenna should anything come down. So I'm feeling pretty safe about it. I got one of these plastic command hooks from Home Depot to support the building side of the end-fed half wave. I got the one specifically meant for showers. I don't know that that's gonna make a difference. It looks exactly like all the others, but maybe it's like a little bit more waterproof than its friends. And rather than use the adhesive it comes with, I'm gonna use some of this VHB tape here, also available from any big box store. It's just gonna be a lot stronger of an attachment than a command strip would be. To hold up the other end, I've got one of these. This is a driveway reflector stake. You can get them in just about any big box store. I found mine at Menards. They're meant to stick into your lawn or your driveway just to remind you where the edges are once it snowed really deeply. I like these because they're a pretty durable plastic and they're really cheap. I think this one was like two or three bucks. I'll hit both of these plastic pieces with a little bit of rough sandpaper just so their surface isn't quite as slick before I hit them with a little black outdoor spray paint, both to help disguise them and make them maybe a little bit more weatherproof. Now, there are lots of different ways I could mount that mast, but at the risk of being a little bit extra, and since I do have a 3D printer, I 3D printed this thing out of PETG that'll hold the mast down the center and be screwed right into the top of the roof. Winnie, is this too much? Is this too much? Yes. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of this high gloss lacquer to hopefully make it a little bit more weatherproof than it would be on its own. I designed a couple holes into the side of this mount to put a bolt through or something, but I think a big squirt of high temp hot glue should hold things just fine. There shouldn't be a lot of upward force on this in any case. And onto the top of the garage it goes. I've got some brown paracord here that's gonna act like my halyard line so I can raise and lower the antenna when I want to. Just some nice long wood screws down to the top of the garage there. Ooh, look at that concentration face. I'm also gonna add one of these rope loops here just to help manage the halyard line once it's up. That just gets screwed into the side of the roof as well. And then this mast point and the uh, halyard rope should be good to go. I'll also use a line to support the other end of the antenna, which I'll tie off to one of these rope cleats that I'm gonna sneakily hide behind my drain pipe here. I've actually run out of paracord at this point, so I'm just gonna use this ball of kitchen twine that I found in a drawer. I'm actually not too sad about this for the moment because I reckon this is going to be overloaded and snap at some point, and I'd rather this line snap rather than yanking down the support point that's VHB taped to the side of the building. Finally, the antenna wire. I'm just gonna use this 24 gauge gray stranded wire I had in my junk box, and I'm gonna loosely measure it out with my arm span there, just to a generous amount more than the length of the antenna that I'm anticipating. I wanna be able to trim this thing down to length and not have to add more once it's in the air. For testing purposes, I'm gonna use the same spark plug, uh, 64 to one on on that I demoed a few weeks back. Long term, I'd like to use something with a little bit more power handling capability and a slightly more rugged form factor. But again, this is just a quick test for today and this is gonna do just fine. I'll strip off a bit of the insulation here and wrap it around the nut on the end of the spark plug antenna. Don't forget to plug in the coax before hoisting it into the air. Then loosely tie the twine around the toroid, just as a support point for now, and haul one end of the antenna into the air. Then I'll tie the paracord around the other end of the antenna and use that rope to lift the antenna skyward. I have to run around to the other side of the garage here to pull in the rope, which makes it hard to see what's going on, but it's pretty easy to feel when that antenna goes tight. Oh yeah. All right, so this is, I mean, this is just that 24 gauge gray wire and it's not invisible, but it's not super visible. And when this becomes 26 gauge steel, I think, I mean, look, it's already, you know, it's not close to, but it's not far from these other lines. I don't think anyone's ever gonna know. Well, let's go, I mean, now I gotta tune the thing. So let's go to the Nano VNA and see how much too long this is. Hey. So this is a sweep of this NFED halfway setup, and you can see it goes from seven megahertz, so at the very bottom of the 40 meter band, all the way up to uh, 29.7 megahertz, the top of the 10 meter band. Um, because in theory, as a, a NFED halfway cut for 40 meters, it should be usable on 40, 20, and 10. Um, now, what I suspect is happening is I, I've deliberately cut this too long. 
So instead of being resonant at around 14 megahertz, it's resonant around 12. Uh, I'll bet where it was supposed to be resonant around seven, like seven is the bottom of my sweep there. Oh, this is interesting. Even though it's off scale high here, watch, watch my cursor position and watch this little SWR number at the top, right? So there's our resonant point around 12 megahertz. As I scroll down, right, the frequency up here goes down past nine, uh, SWR is now at 25 to one. But as I get to the very bottom of my range, it starts to fall, right? It's down to 13 to one down to 10 to one. So I think there's another dip down here off scale low that I can't see, which is fair. Cause again, I cut this too long. So my dips are at 12.2 and this next one is at 18. That's interesting. And this one up here is at about 24. Should be, won't be, okay, so that's encouraging. So we normally would want to dip around like uh, uh, 14 megahertz and 28 megahertz, and instead they're at 12 and 24. So they are in fact harmonically related, which is good. So I'm gonna lower the end of the antenna again and trim it a little shorter, and then we'll come back and repeat the process. I'm not gonna try and get this length spot on with the first trim. I'd rather cut it in small stages and take intermediate measurements. It is so exciting to have what is essentially a pair of very janky halyards strung up at my QTH. Like I've never had that before. Uh, so if I can get this working, it's gonna be great. All right, I've cut a little bit off. Now a little back of the envelope math said I would probably have to shorten the antenna by about five feet uh, to get from 12.2 to about 14.1 megahertz. So being conservative, I only cut off about two feet. And uh, as predicted, that's only moved the, uh, the point of low SWR there up about uh, 500, uh, 500 kilohertz. So got to rinse and repeat until I get it just right. And after about maybe half an hour of lower the wire down, snip eight inches off, bring the wire back up, come back over here, check the SWR curve per band, go back, cut another eight inches off and so on and so on. Here is the SWR curve for the 40 meter bands. This is a suite from seven to 7.3, all below three to one. The minimum is about two to one, right about 7.12 megahertz there. And here's the 20 meter band, everything very flat at about 1.7 to one SWR, pretty darn good all the way across the band there. And uh, then I screwed something up on the 10 meter band and it's, you know, it's like 300 to one, which I think is a problem with how I calibrated the nano VNA and hopefully not an issue with the um, antenna itself. But uh, let me get my other antenna, line, uh, antenna analyzer out and we'll see if we can uh, reconcile that discrepancy got my little RF analyst from Autech here in this mode where it flashes back and forth between the frequency in megahertz and the current SWR. So we can kind of see them both at the same time. So at seven megahertz, it's a really touchy tuning there. And that's about 1.4, 1.5, according to this guy, which is good. At the upper end of the band, about two to one. That's quite good. Let's go to 20 meters up here at 14.0-ish, 2.2 and 14.35 ish 2.2 as well great uh let's go up to 10 meters up here looks like it's a little oh there's some part so up here at 29.5 we're at 2.3 the lower part of the band 3.4 so maybe we want to have a tuner in line there if we wanted to do 10 meters and then in theory a 40 meter antenna should be able to do um, 15 meters, right? Like that's a, a third harmonic. So here at tw around 21 megahertz, 21 megahertz or so, yeah, 1.4, 1.5 to one, which, you know, it doesn't necessarily say it's a good antenna, but at least it's a resonant antenna. Um, well, let's get the, uh, let's get the radio out and see how it sounds at least on these bands. Looks like I was on 20 meters last time. And it looks like we've got about S7 noise on the band, which is frankly not as bad as I thought it might be. There's somebody coming in like an S9 to beat that S7 noise. It was 20 over S9 there, that's amazing. Oh, it's the CW sweepstakes. That's CQSS for ARL sweepstakes. Wow, so busy band on CW today, that makes sense. 
All right. Well, there's 20. Wow, huge signal there. Well, so far I'd call that a ringing success. We'll just have to see how it holds up in the weather, which is gonna come our way sooner rather than later. Uh, and there's still some work to be done, switching things out from these sort of temporary material to a more final setup. So uh, take it away, future Jeff. Thanks, past Jeff. Well, the uh, new materials didn't arrive before the first snow of the season, but it does look like things are still holding on okay up there. So hopefully they'll hold on for just a few more days. Yes, packages are arriving. When you look, it's packages. So first up is this 100 foot spool of 44 pound test stainless steel leader wire, it's fishing wire. Um, this was recommended, uh, somebody on the Ham Radio Workbench podcast recommended this as a near invisible antenna wire for situations that require us, and I think mine does, so we'll give this a try. And then I also got some monofilament wire, you know, some, some clear fishing line, just in case I wanna make any other support lines particularly stealthy as well. Now for the big box, the DX Engineering box. First out is a hunk of 75 feet of RG8X coax with no connectors. We'll get to those in a second. There's the PL259 connectors as well as the little adapters that you need to fit them down to uh, RG8X coax. A little dielectric grease to squirt in those connectors just to help keep things a little extra waterproof outside there. And of course, the sticker. Oh, so many stickers. We have all the stickers. After putting a PL259 connector on one end of that coax, it's time to put it to use. That's going to mean lowering the antenna wire back in using that halyard line, attaching it, raising the antenna back up, and then trying to dress this coax along the side of my building as stealthily as I can using some points that I think were used to maybe attach an old awning. I'll take the coax up and over this doorway here, and then it's just a matter of figuring out how I get that bare end of coax through the brick wall into my office. It looks like somebody's gone and punched a hole through my wall for me. That's very convenient. Um, if it had been me, I probably would have used something like, I don't know, like a 12 inch uh, masonry bit that you could buy at any hardware store. And then if I had maybe found out that that was too short, uh, maybe I would have had to go to something a little bit longer, like maybe an 18 inch installers bit, which is really only meant through wood, but I probably would have found that after the first 12 inches, I was through all the brick and just needed to get through the interior walls. Um, but like I say, uh, it was not me who put this hole here, somebody else did, and I'm grateful to them. All jokes aside, this is just a standard outdoor electrical box with a nice waterproof gasket there. It's Tapcon into the wall with a couple of number six Tapcon screws. And then you can probably see behind it, I've wedged a little bit of uh, additional waterproof gasketing in just to help keep water out of the junction between the box and the wall itself. I'll make a little hole in the bottom of this box just so I can get the coax through once the lid is on, blow out all the extraneous dust from the drilling, and then it's just a matter of feeding the remaining 30 or so feet of coax through into my office. How cool. That is one advantage to this setup is it just looks like another piece of infrastructure. Like that's my antenna entrance. That's an unused bit of AT&T hardware and a bunch of other coax and a bunch of other nonsense running down the wall. Who's gonna look at this twice? Although with that new choke hanging in the air, somebody might look at that twice. That's not the most sightly thing. Hmm. Checking things on the VNA with the new coax gives us a little bit of a weird thing going on. There's this new dip in SWR between about 8.5 and 10.5 megahertz, so generously the 30 meter band. We still have the same dip up here at 14 megahertz for 20 meters and uh, then up at 21 megahertz for 30 meters and up at the very upper end of the 10 meter band. But that new dip shows up on the RF analyst too, so it's not just an artifact on the VNA. This could be caused by a lot of things. Maybe the longer piece of coax is radiating and acting as part of the antenna in a way that the shorter piece of test coax wasn't, or there's some new interaction with other metallic things in the environment. In any case, I'm sure one of you out there in YouTube land knows, so leave me a comment if you think you know what's going on here. All right, here we go. The antenna's into the back of my MFJ Versa tuner, uh, which is just set to bypass. I'm not actually tuning anything. I'm gonna use it for an SWR meter for a sec um, and a power meter. Uh, here goes nothing. Let's see what happens if we turn the radio on, see if we hear anything. Oh, we sure do. Like S6 noise. Uh, this is on just 20 meters. This is where the radio was set when I turned it on. Lots of birdies, but not a lot of signals. Now down on the FT891's narrow bandwidth, this is a 500 uh, hertz filter. We're like an S3 noise. Let's see if that helps us at all. Let's try 40 meters. 
Ah, there's some sounds I was hoping to hear. That's uh, FT4, FT8 traffic somewhere there. I don't know. It's 7.074, whatever one that is. 7.076 has more. Maybe everyone, maybe everyone's just on 40 this time of night. Well, it's early in the morning now and I'm still in my pajamas, but it's the ARRL SSB sweepstakes going on. And as we all know, uh, contests tend to open the bands wide open. So far I'm 18 contacts in everywhere from Oregon to Montana to Prince Edward Island. I have no illusions that my little antenna and currently 25 watts SSB is really what's getting out there. There's just a lot of large stations on the band with lots of power and big antennas, but they're contacts, I'll take them. Hey, that was KU8T uh, from Ohio in Park Kilo 8108, which uh, the POTUS spotting website tells me is Kildeer Plain State Wildlife Area. Well, that's exciting. It's obvious to me, and this is a thing I've been told my entire ham radio career, is that, you know, CW compared to SSB, you have a much better chance of making a, a low power or compromise antenna or long distance contact just because of the advantages of narrow bandwidth and increased comprehensibility and so on. My ability to punch through to what is also going to be a remote station probably running a compromise-ish antenna on CW um, is certainly better than my ability to punch through to even a large contest station running a bunch of watts and a nice antenna. Um, so when I was setting this antenna up, I sort of assumed it would be largely a CW antenna because I can just get farther on 10 watts and a compromise antenna on CW than I can on 25 watts SSB in the same situation. And so far, that's that's playing out. Um, over the past couple days, I've picked up uh, a bunch of CW POTA stations uh, from Texas to Florida, New Jersey, North Carolina, Alabama, and this morning, Ohio. So, so far, things are working out fine. There's enough to talk about with the construction of the final Anon that's replacing that spark plug antenna that it really deserves to be its own video. Between the theory of the thing, the actual construction methods, the assembly, the testing and verification that it actually worked, and honestly, some of the troubleshooting when it didn't work the first time, I really am going to make a whole separate video about this. Also, it took me a lot longer than I thought it was going to, which means I can tell you that this spark play antenna survived being up for about four months of Chicago winter and did surprisingly well. There's a little bit of tarnishing on these brass sections here, but for four months outside in Chicago, I'm pretty darn impressed. Roger. So I owe you a little more information about the Anun, but for now I'll say 73 and hope to hear you on the air. Thanks, number 19 Alpha, 19 Alpha, Kilo Kilo 9, Juliet Echo Fox, check 04, India Lima. Okay, let's see, um, I copy 19 Alpha, and, uh, somebody has your check inspection again? Yeah, check 04, Illinois, 04.